when Cindy and I came with Ben and pulled up here, we thought, I thought, I'm back home. I grew up in the hills of West Virginia. And this building is really nice compared to places I've preached in younger years. In fact, you have what's called indoor plumbing. <laughs> and uh, we didn't have that in some of the places where I've been privileged to speak uh, back in the hills. And so it's really great to be among you. I've gotten to know several of your young people. I've gotten to know Elizabeth and Cord and Jonathan Haynes for years in working with them at camp. And then they drove Ben up there. And then Hannah and Sarah and some of their cousins have come up as well. And you know people we know, like Holson Backs and people like that. We won't talk about that right now. So it's just a delight to get to share with you. I'm really glad we've got some younger people here. Younger than me. I'm a dinosaur. I, I realize that. I'm 60 years old. But there's some girls roaming around here tonight who look like dinosaurs, too. They've gotten the dinosaurs, the stegosaurs, the brachiosaurs, all the sauropods. They're all in there. And so I'm going to do something really weird tonight. Just kind of own it right up. We're going to talk about, in the beginning, God made dinosaurs. And so we really want to just kind of investigate dinosaurs and where they fit in Bible history. And so some people will say, well, dinosaurs have never existed. Well, I think there's a good bit of evidence in the Bible that would argue that they indeed did exist. And there's a lot of other information about them as well. And the primary motivation is I've got little grandsons and they're into dinosaurs and they're into dragons. And what I'm really concerned about is when they pick up particular documents about dinosaurs, they read that they have been extinct for the last 60 some million years and that dinosaurs were all extinct before humans ever came to the earth. I don't think that's what I'm reading in my Bible at all. And so we want to look at this study from a, what does the Bible say about these great beasts? And not try to say, well, what does science theorize? But what does the Bible say? And then look at science through the lens of Scripture, not the opposite. And so we need to distinguish between scientific theory, observation, and Baconian logic that says we look at what we can see and what we can reproduce, and that develops scientific law, kind of like Isaac Newton noticed that things kept falling and called it the law of gravity. So we want to look at the Bible and let the Bible drive the study about dinosaurs. So I hope that you'll go on this journey with us. And if you have questions at the end, please feel free to ask. We've got some resources available for you to look at. I will remind you that some of these resources come from folks who might tell you that all you need to do is accept Jesus as your personal Savior. And you'll be saved. I don't think that's true. But there is a good bit of factual information in these documents as well. But we want to focus our attention on the very words of God. So that may be helpful to you as we walk through this study. We can really start out by reading from 2 Timothy in chapter 3 as we think about in the beginning God made the dinosaurs. As we think about 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're reminded that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for proof Direction, for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness, that the men of God may be complete, thoroughly, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the scriptures are going to tell us what we need to know about every aspect of life. And so we're going to want to be prepared for when our kids go to college to be prepared as they face their biology and their chemistry and all of their hard sciences. That when someone starts telling them about dinosaurs have been extinct for millions and millions of years, they're going to have some equipment from Scripture and from history to help them. So that's our approach as we think about that. How long did it take God to create the earth and everything in it? Well, let's, let's look at that, and let's just notice from Genesis chapter 1. I encourage you to open your Bible and read along with us. And notice what God says. Let's pick up our reading in verse 20 of Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters, and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. 
God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You just read about dinosaurs. You might not have noticed it because the word dinosaur didn't show up, did it? In fact, it couldn't have shown up just like you wouldn't find the word Google in your Bible. Is Google a word? Well, it is now. We're not talking about a gaggle. We're talking about Google. And we're talking about the Internet. You're not going to read about the Internet in the Bible because the word had not been invented. Just like the word dinosaur had not been invented until about 1840. And so as we think about those kind of things, we're finding some new evidence. We're finding some great big bones. And we don't know what to do with all of those bones. But some people started noticing we've got to call it something. And so we're going to read about people who describe these as terrible lizards. I want to notice a couple things with you about the days of creation. And there's a handout here by David Pratt that's going to explain that pretty well. But the word day is almost always used to refer to a 24-hour day. There are some exceptions. And sometimes we're talking about a period of time, like in the days of the judges. But every time in the Bible when you find a number, a cardinal number, beside the word day, every time in Scripture, it's a 24-hour day. I remember a scientist from Australia making an observation when he talked about God took six days to create everything. And that Australian time said, why did he take so long? You know, if he is the God who has spoken the universe into existence, he didn't have to take days to do it. He could have done it in milliseconds. But I suggest to you that as we read the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we need to read them as history. That's the way Jesus understood them. Jesus would speak about Noah. Jesus would speak about Adam and Eve. And Jesus would say, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And he's talking about a man and woman, as you notice from Mark chapter 10. So I'm going to suggest to you, we don't have to run away from what God says about the creation. And the amazing thing about it is God spoke it into existence. And I want you to think about parent age versus real age. How old were Adam and Eve when they were created? Well, it was just a day old. It was their birthday. But how old did they look? There's a difference between apparent age and real age. Let me give you another example in the New Testament. When Jesus created all those fish out of those five loaves and those two fish, and he fed 5,000 people, how old were those fish? Well, they were only minutes old. But they looked fully developed, and when you chewed them, they tasted like those three- and four-year-old fish. And so when a supernatural event occurs, when God injects himself into nature, nature domiciles, that creation and makes it look like it's much older. And so the apparent age versus real age can be different. And for those of you who are astronomical in your thinking, and you're thinking about light, that's one of the real challenges. How long does it take for light to get to the earth? <coughs> Isn't it possible that God could speak those stars into existence with the light already protruding through the universe? Is that possible? Could God do that? So I want you to think clearly and critically about what we find here. So we're going to look at these two guys. We're going to notice a couple of guys who decided we're finding these big bones over here. They know what we're going to call them. And so it was a British scientist named Richard Owen who decided to call these Dino Sour. Dino is mighty, terrible. Sour is lizard. Mighty lizards. And, and so that's where the word was spawned in the 1840s. But back in 1822, there was another guy named Gideon Mantell, 
And he'd been finding all these bones around Sussex in England, and he noticed that their skeletal structure was different than reptiles, and the hip structure was different so that these animals actually walked more to the right. If you've been to any major museums, you see these bones. Please be advised that oftentimes when you see the bones, you're not seeing a full skeleton. And when those who put together, the paleontologists will put together those bones, if they're going to be honest with you, they'll tell you which ones they made up and which ones they really dug up to make it all fit together. But we have full skeletons of a lot of different kinds of dinosaurs. And so these men named them dinosaurs. So if you're reading through your Bible and you don't find the word dinosaur, it didn't exist. You know, in the King James translation in the early 1600s, dinosaur wasn't a word for another 200 years. So you're not going to read that word, but you're going to read about those beasts. In fact, the Bible often called dragons. So does the Bible mention dinosaurs? Well, I think it probably does. I think we just read about dinosaurs and God's creation of them. But maybe we need to do a little bit more work in a poetic book, which is always dangerous when you're reading a poetic book and trying to get a historical flavor. So let's go to the book of Job, and let's look in chapter 39. Job 39. And let's just notice as God is challenging Job to look around. He thinks he knows so much. He thinks he can tell God how to run his world. And so he's going to challenge Job. Why don't you look at these things? Tell me these answers and then we'll discuss it. Mountain goat. Did you see them in Job, Job 39 verse 1? Is mountain goat a real thing? Mountain goats really exist? So you got mountain goats in verse 1. Let's go on down to verse 5 then. And of course, God is saying, hey, look at the mountain goat. Do you know what it has? Look at the wild donkey. Are donkeys real? I know, Mark, they're not mules. I know the difference, okay? But they're somewhat similar, okay? They fit within the kind, not the species, but the kind. And so, donkeys, though, are they real? Those are real beings, right? How about verse 9? Any of you have ever worked with an ox? I have. I've seen oxen work, but I've never worked with them. Wild ox, is that a real thing? Is Job able to look at these real creatures and learn some things? And as you wait looking at the uh, crazy ostrich and realizing how flighty she is, do you notice that ostrich there in verse 13? Do you notice, maybe you've seen one of these, it's called horse? Verse 19, are those real animals? Could Job look at a horse and learn some amazing things about God? Yeah, these, these are all real animals that he could look at. But I want you to notice as we go on, though, notice chapter 40 and verse 15. Now we've got, and this word's used a lot for big trucks. I think probably especially diesels, I'm not sure. But you've got the behemoth, the really big one. And so beginning in verse 15 of chapter 40, behemoth, which I made as well as you. I made him, I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold, now his strength in his, is in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He bends his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Let his maker bring near his sword. Surely the mountains bring him food, and all the beasts of the field play there. Under the lotus plants he lies down, in the cover of the reeds and the marsh. The lotus plants cover him with shade, the willows of the brook surround him. If a river rages, he is not a wash. He is confident, though the Jordan rushes to his mouth. Can anyone capture him when he is on watch? With bars, can anyone pierce his nose? Now, we looked at the mountain goat, we looked at the donkey, we looked at, we didn't look at the eagle and the hawk, I missed those two. We looked at horses. And now, Job, I want you to look at this fellow. I want you to look at this big guy. And you can't handle him, but you think you can handle me? I want to suggest to you this, this being is a real being. Now, I know Job is a poetic book, but he's being made to look at these huge creatures that God has made. And then you've got another one in chapter 41. You've got this one named Leviathan. He's an amazing creature. And sometimes the Bible uses Leviathan to refer to almost very powerful rulers. So we have to be careful as we watch this. But let's read about this guy. You know, press down his tongue with cord. 
Are you going to put a rope in his nose? Are you going to pierce his jaw and look? Is he going to plead? Is he going to make a supplication? Will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him for a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you bind him for your maidens? Will the traders bargain over him? Will they divide him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons? Or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle. You won't do it again. It's like a pretty fierce beast, doesn't it? And so as you think about that, I'm going to suggest to you that what we call dinosaurs, Job must have had some experience with. Now we've got to deal with when did Job live, and quite frankly, we don't know. But there are some indications that Job lived after the flood. But did you notice about Behemoth back there in chapter 40? Did you notice about his tail? His tail is in verse 17 like cedar. People who read that say, hmm, must be talking about a hippo. Hmm, maybe he's talking about a bigger, maybe he's talking about an elephant. Now, I don't know if you're in the tail business or not, but do those look like cedar trees hanging from the back end of those guys? Not at all. Fall Creek Falls, I was in the hemlock forest last week, 60, 70 feet high. That's what a cedar is like. These are little puny tails compared to a cedar. Hippo, elephant, doesn't fit the description hardly at all when we're reading this character, this creature in Job in chapter 40. In fact, sounds more like one of these sauropods. Sounds more like one of these creatures. And it almost sounds like the Argentinas. And so we'll need to think about that. We're looking at a real animal I'm going to suggest to you in chapter 40. Maybe a, a potosaurus, maybe a brontosaurus. By the way, brontosaurus, do you remember Fred Flintstone? That brontosaurus stuff, brontosaurus first, <laughs> there was no real dinosaur named a brontosaurus. They thought there was, but it was a hoax. So you have to really watch what you're digging up. And make sure you don't connect from miles apart and try to put together a dinosaur. This is sounds more like an apocus or an Argentine saurus. And so as you, you might not, as I did, know anything about the Argentine Saurus. I had a friend named Ben Smith up in, at, at Murfreesboro from North Alabama who was really into dinosaurs. I thought, this is great. You can help me a lot here. And so if you go down with Planta, you can see the Arch, Argentina Saurus. Can you imagine where this thing was found? Argentina Saurus. You got it. It's Argentina. That's where they found this guy. And he's the largest one that has ever been discovered. Now, if you want to need a little bit of scale to see this guy, look at this little girl. She just had her second baby, by the way. Alyssa is standing there at the base of one of his feet. Huge. And they got a lot of these bones. And they put them all together in the Fernbank Museum there in Atlanta, Georgia. Fernbank Museum of Natural History. You, you go over there and see it. It'd be pretty cool. But I want you to think about, then, could Job have seen something like that? As we think about Leviathan in chapter 41, it says, In that day the Lord will, hit, will with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent. And he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. Now that's poetic too, Isaiah 27 and verse 1. But we see God mentioning this terrible beast, calling him a serpent, calling him a fleeing serpent, a reptile in the sea. And so as you read that picture that we saw in the behemoth in chapter 40 and the Leviathan in chapter 41, some conclusions can be made about those creatures. I'm going to suggest to you they're largely aquatic, hanging around the water a good bit. They have a armored hide that's invulnerable to weapons. No creature like them on the earth. You read that in the Bible. That's where you found that information. So as we think about this, it almost sounds something like a dragon. Now these are artist depictions here. These are not real skeletal remains or anything like that. But the idea in the Bible that several times comes up is the idea of dragons. I'm not sure why, but my four-year-old grandson has seemed to lay off with the dinosaur phrase, and now all of those creatures, he's calling dragons. Maybe there's a connection there as we consider that 
from the scriptures. In fact, 21 times the Hebrew uses the word tanin to refer to dragons or sea monsters. These references to creatures called dragons can be found in nearly every human culture over the past several centuries. Could it be that in modern times, the word, di the word dinosaur has taken the place of the word, the Bible translates it, dragon. It's 1946 dictionary. It defines the word dragon as a huge serpent, a saurian. It's a creature, and the footnote says, claiming these creatures to be now rare. Well, that was in 1946. I don't know if they're rarer now than they were then, but that's, that's the dictionary definition in that time. So what evidence can we observe that would prove dinosaurs existed. You know, I'm thinking back, I think it was 71 when Neil Armstrong got on the, uh, landed on the moon. And there are people who say, no, that was a hoax. We've never been on the moon. And there's some folks who say, no, dinosaurs is a hoax. There, there really have never been dinosaurs. There's sure a lot of bones. There's sure a lot of skeletons. And there's sure a lot of fossils. In fact, you're looking in Utah at about 10,000 complete fossils. Fossils form when an animal dies very quickly and minerals take the place of the bone. And so there's several things that we can see. And you can go to Dinosaur National Park in Utah, and they'll let you dig. And you can dig up some dinosaur bones. Some really big dinosaurs have been found in northern Indiana in the wild fields just in the last few years. And so as we think about those kind of things, I want to just show you some evidence. You see all those bones there? Those are dinosaur bones. And so as you think about it, you can see that a lot of dinosaurs aren't very big. Now, there were a few that were really big, but a lot of dinosaurs, most dinosaurs, in fact, were about the size of a cow. That was about the size. Some of them were really small, but it has to do with their structure, and particularly their hip skeletal structure, so that they don't crawl like a typical lizard. And so as you think about it, we, we tend to think about the big guys. We tend to think about the T-Rexes, and they're the very popular model that gets our little kids into thinking about those kind of beasts. Those are real skeletons. Those are real remains. But once you look at this one, does that look like a bone? It looks like the inside of a bone. Well, I haven't seen the inside of my bones. Well, this is the inside of a bone. It's a big bone. And this is found in the Liscombe bone bed in northern Alaska. These dinosaur bones were found frozen and unfossilized. They hadn't turned into rock. They're still bone form. And when they cut into them, they found blood cells still in the bones. Now, blood cells decompose over time. But they found the blood cells still inside those bones in northern Alaska. Liscombe bone bed. And I've got copies of the outline for you to check out all this stuff. Don't you ever, don't ever take my word for it. Once you do, go, go it. All right? Be careful with your Wikipedia, okay? But, but go ahead and check it out and check your primary sources. And so as you think about that, notice, notice what this particular lady says about that. She says, but blood cells in the dinosaur bones should have disappeared eons ago. I got goosebumps. It was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. It looked like modern bone. The bones are, after all, 65 million years old. How could cells survive that long? Now, I want you to see there's a word um, that Philip Johnson uses in Darwin on trial, and it's a tautology. It's a circular reason. She's already assumed that dinosaurs have been extinct for 65 million years. Yet she's looking at blood cells that at the best could be only a few hundred or maybe a thousand years old. But she's already decided that the dinosaurs have been extinct for 65 million years. So she's saying, I'm looking at this and it can't be possible. She's rejecting the evidence because of a former theory that she has accepted as true. You've got to watch that all the time. Especially those of you who are headed to college, in college. You've got to watch that on several different disciplines in regard to those things, you're seeing a very young bone with the blood cells still in it, frozen intact in northern Alaska. 
So as you consider that, the most detailed fossils ever found were found in Alberta, Canada in 2011. I want you to see this guy. It's a notosaur. And when you look at him, you can see the armored plates. You see? He's fossilized. Alberta, Canada. And you can see the armored plates. You see his head. He looks like kind of a crocodile, doesn't he? You can even see some of the dinosaur skin pigmentation as we continue. And so as we watch this develop, you see his scaly, scaly uh, outer shell. That's, that's how they found it. You see those pointed characteristics on this dog? And so as you look at it, you're looking at a recent time, 2011, and I want you to notice fully developed. And then look at the pigmentation. We know those colors because some of the colors bled into the stone surrounding the box. Now, if that's billions of years old, that's not available anymore. That's not visible anymore. But you can still see that pigmentation from that find in 2011. That's the Nullasaur. So as we think about, is there any physical evidence that dinosaurs and human beings actually lived at the same time? Well, if we trust God, we trust Genesis, we trust Job, obviously there's evidence that dinosaurs and humans coexisted. But is there any fossilized evidence that humans... See the Biloxi River there in Texas? You see that hand in that three-toed dinosaur print? There are human fossilized prints within the dinosaur prints in the Biloxi River. And if you want to say, find more about this, a guy named Don Patton. You can just Google Don Patton. And he's actually speaking tonight in Nashville about these kind of things. He's got dinosaur bones of his own. And he can tell you a lot more about his finds in the Biloxi River Valley near Glen Rose, Texas. That's, that's what you're looking at in that particular slide. So that seems to point out evidence of human and dinosaur coexistence. But let's think about this. I mean, this is not going to show up very well. Mark, could you turn the lights up for just a moment? I think it'll, it'll show up a little better that way. I don't have a laser printer. We're going to be in the dark. Can you see anyone? Look far left. Do you see something kind of going down? And then back up and around. And then you can you see over the top right? You see that curved neck and head? Can, can you see that? You can see that, can't you? I think that'll work. Thank you very much. So I, I don't know what you think you're seeing there. Does that almost look like a dinosaur? Kind of one of those long-tailed dinosaurs. It looks that way, doesn't it? But I want to tell you about those folks. Those are found at the Kachina Bridge Petroglyph in Natural Bridges National Park in Utah. And most scientists, most evolutionists, agree that those petroglyphs on these natural rock bridges were carved by Native Americans somewhere between 400 years after Jesus and 1,300 years after Jesus. But they got a problem with that picture. Because if these people lived 400 to 1,300 AD and they're drawing pictures of dinosaurs, dinosaurs are supposed to be extinct for 65 million years, where did they see something like that to draw it? And so, they won't even entertain the idea that these are drawings from what they have visibly observed in those dinosaurs because they've already decided dinosaurs predate the existence of humans. So you look for yourself and you decide what you're seeing in that petroglyph. Then we have the Akambaro figures. The Akambaro figures were found by a German archaeologist in 19... 45. These were found at the foot of the hill in Guanajuato, Mexico. And the figures vary greatly in appearance. They range from utensils to pottery to animals to humanoids. Now, look at those guys. Weird looking, aren't they? They almost look like could be. They look like dinosaurs. And so in this Chicopacaro collection, the claim of the archaeologists was that these finds are about 2,500 years old. 
And in these particular collections, they've said these are real. These have not been hoax. They're not frauds. These are real cut out pottery from people's hands. Where would they get that stegosaurus kind of look? Where would they get that apotosaurus look? Where would they find those kind of things? And so what they did, they found over 30,000 figures in that day. 30,000 of them. But there were so many of them looked like dinosaurs. You know what they did the ones, with the ones that looked like dinosaurs? Oh, must be a hoax. Can't be real because dinosaurs didn't exist with humans. So the rest of them are the Chikaparo exhibit, but they brushed aside the dinosaur that he wanted. How convenient. And so just kind of watch through that. Watch what you see in the sky. And, and notice this uniquely carved one as he comes up here. See those guys? Those are the hard hits, by the way. Look at this guy. Certainly not a Leviathan. He died in that baby. <laughs> and, and so these are what they found in that collection of 30,000 pieces of utensils, pottery in that period of time. And so I want to suggest to you something that Mark Smith has said that I think we need to give some consideration to. We're taught that the universe is billions of years old. Could scientists be incorrect about that estimate? Even though the Bible is not intended to be a timekeeping device or a document of record chronologically, if we counted all the apparent lapses of time in the vast genealogical record, we would come up with no more than even possibly 10 to 20,000 years. More strictly speaking, it seems like from the biblical record, the earth is less than 10,000 years old. He suggests 6,000 years old. Well, that doesn't fit with evolutionary science at all. I'm just going to ask you, who do you going to trust? There is a trust factor in these regards. So I want you to think a little bit about the method of carbon dating. You ever heard of carbon-14 and carbon dating? Radioactive decay? Sure, if you're in an RN program, you've heard about those things, Elizabeth. You know about carbon-14. Well, a recent article came out, I think it was this year, that has suggested that carbon dating is so random and so inconsistent that we're afraid that we might have, in our radiological efforts to treat cancer, may have created more harm than good because we don't really understand the isotopes that are breaking down in carbon-14 and their half-life. And, and so as we consider that, and I can give you the documentation, I don't have that in print for you to take home. So as we think about those kind of things, I want you to look at this rock here. See that rock? Archaeologists estimate with carbon dating that it's 135 million years old. But they had a problem because they came across this hammer. It's called the London Hammer. This is in London, Texas. And so here they're finding a hammer that is styled like what Americans used in the 1800s as their hammer. We call it sledge, wouldn't we? Something like a sledgehammer. The sledgehammer looks like it was in the 1800s, but they're saying the rock around is 135 million years old. Hmm. Could one of those dates be incorrect? You decide. It's the London Hammer. You could look it up. And in the little document over here, Unraveling Evolution by Joshua Gerker, he's going to talk more about that. He's a brother in Christ. Um, and um, he works for the USDA in Philadelphia. He's a good scientist. So he, he could have some helpful information for you there. Then there is, you've heard of the rhinestone cowboy? Well, this is the limestone cowboy, right? Ouch. <laughs> what you're seeing there is a cowboy boot pretty much designed in the 1950s. It was found, I believe, in 1980 in Texas. That broke his leg. I don't know what happened to the rest of it, but that's his petrol petrified, fossilized, leg bone, still in the cowboy boots. Did you get to the dates? 1950s, 1980, that boot was found in Iran. It's two A's, Iran, A, 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 Texas. Iran, Texas. And it's completely petrified inside. It's cowboy boots. Estimated to be good, maybe about 1950. Now, what do you think about something? Any of you alive in 1980? 
I know I'm a dinosaur, but I was alive in 1980. I don't know if you're Grandpa, were you alive in 1980? He was. He was. I'm telling you. In 1980, there was a big fire. I mean, a big fire. It was called Mount St. Helens. Remember Washington? Remember that explosion of that volcano? 25 feet of sediment came down on the ground in a day. Spirit Lake was filled with tons and tons of trees. With the water, the pressure, and the heat, coal was formed within months. But we're always told that it takes millions or billions of years to produce coal. No, it doesn't. It can take months if you have the right ingredients, you have the right food, and you have the right heat and pressure. If you want to know about how quickly catastrophism can change the landscape, just take some time to study Mount St. Helens. And so the thing that drove Charles Darwin, besides the death of his daughter, and blame God for that, one of the things that drove Charles Darwin toward the theory of organic general evolution was that he was friends with a guy named Charles Lyell. And Charles Lyell believed in uniformitarianism. He believed everything in the earth changed slowly over long periods of time. And so that fed Darwin's theory of long periods of time for change. But if you know anything about, say, Washington, anything about Mount St. Helens, you know the whole landscape changed in a matter of minutes, not millions of years. And so catastrophism is God's explanation. Can you think of anything catastrophic that has ever occurred to just kind of overwhelm the earth with water? I'm sure you can, and I'm not trying to be silly, but I am trying to get you to think. So what happened to the dinosaurs? You know what? We don't know. I'm glad Ken Ham in answering Genesis. Answers in Genesis, I think, the name of his work. You ever heard of the Noah's Ark over there by Cincinnati? He's the guy with the brainchild behind that. The Creation Museum there, very worthwhile. He said, we don't know what happened. And he's right. We don't know what happened to the dinosaurs. There are a lot of postulated suggestions. Dozens of theories have been conjured up in the last century by creationists and evolutionists. The most popular theory among evolutionary scientists is that there was a meteorite storm. It came 66 million years ago and wiped out all the dinosaurs. I would ask the same question of those men that God asked of Job. Were you there? Pretty insightful. Were you there, Job? We weren't there. So we don't know by personal observation. And so as we consider that, there were 30 million fossil fragments in the area of Utah. And conservative estimate, we have discovered the tomb of 10,000 dinosaurs. You know who's telling us that stuff? You ever heard of Jurassic Park? I've not seen any of the movies. So for all of you who've seen all those scary dinosaur monster movies in Jurassic Park, the guy who's telling you this stuff was the mastermind behind that series. John Horner. He's known as Jack Horner, uh, more popularly from his scientific work. And here's what Mr. Horner has to say about all these 10,000 dinosaurs found in Utah. He said there was a flood. This was no ordinary spring flood from one of the streams in the area, but a catastrophic inundation. That's our best explanation. This guy doesn't believe in God, best I can tell. But he said, this was a huge flood. It seems to make the most sense. And on the basis of it, we believe that this was a living, breathing group of dinosaurs destroyed in one catastrophic moment. Hmm. Just sounds like you're reading Genesis 6. And so as you consider that then, could it be possible that most dinosaurs, along with every other living thing that didn't get on that big boat, died in the flood? And of course, we have quotations from Genesis chapter 6, that I'm going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. That's God's statement. And then when you take that information and you look at the death pose, that's what it's called. When you find so many of these dinosaurs, they're death pose. Let me give you the right name. It is an epistatonic death pose. That's the scientific name. And a trend exists where whenever mostly intact dinosaur skeletons are found, 
That's the pose of the dinosaur. Neck is way back. Often the dinosaur's head is thrown back and its tail arched upward. Often the neck bones are found to have been snapped, which science scream would cause asphyxiation as if gasping for air. They are swallowing lots of water and lots of mud in that inundation. They're trying to get their breath and they die drowning in water and mud. It's the death pose. And that's what we find with many of the dinosaurs where we find full skeletons. They're trying to breathe but they're submerged. And so as I might quote Brian Switek, he says, although the roads to the opisthotonic death pose are many, immersion, <coughs> immersion in water is the simplest explanation. Hmm. Sounds like it was a flood. Sounds like most of the dinosaurs died in that flood. But then there's this question about no and big boat. Could Noah have gotten dinosaurs on the boat? God's bringing two of every kind of animal. Doesn't say every species. You could bring two dogs and you have two of the canine family. That's the word kind. We're talking more like phyla, not species. Could God have brought dinosaurs on the boat? He could. He would have had room for the really big ones, but he could have brought young ones. These are just possibilities, plausibilities we don't know for sure. But I want to suggest to you, if dinosaurs still existed in Job's day, they probably existed in Noah's day, and probably some of them were not on the boat. Just a consideration. Back in Job 22, the question is, will you keep to the old way which wicked men have trod, who were cut down before their time, whose foundations were swept away by a flood? Sounds like Job's buddies knew about a worldwide flood. So Job did indeed observe dinosaurs under God's instruction. It is logical to conclude that dinosaurs lived after the flood. If they lived after the flood, they must have been on the boat. So you were to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, every kind of bird, every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground. So if God told no. So if some dinosaurs were saved by the ark, why are they now extinct? Why don't we still have them roaming around? Again, we just don't know. But it's been observed that many species of wildlife have gone extinct. In fact, the Center for Biological Diversity states that in the past 500 years, we know of approximately 1,000 species that have become extinct. So the bottom line is, how does this affect us and our faith in God? That's the really important thing. I hope that as young people in other places go, whoa, this is really helpful. It'll be helpful to you too. Because you're going to be facing some challenges. And I want to suggest to you that when God says something and he records it through the Holy Spirit, you can trust him. It's just as he said. And you can trust the translation of that information, which is a whole other frontier of study. But you can trust God to accurately describe historically what he has made, what he has destroyed, and what he has preserved. And so as we consider those things, this lesson can help us to say, how does science and natural history fit into God's word? Rather than saying, how do we make God's word fit into what theories men have? Whole different approach. And so when asked difficult questions, we need to say, I don't know if we don't know. And while the topic of dinosaurs will always involve many unknowns, it should not be an extremely intimidating one for us as Christians. Is our faith strong? Do we trust what God says? We can trust science to when it's true science always match up with what God has revealed. And so finally, as we consider that, everything God has created, everything God has created was designed to give him glory. Thought about the 148th Psalm. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. Just take a, just a moment. Let's just go over there. Right after Job, Psalm 148. And in the old sacred, did you ever hear of the sacred selection song book? Now I really am making a dinosaur like myself. It happens to be Psalm number 148 in that particular hymn. Psalm 148 tells us about praising Jehovah. I want you to see the dinosaurs. In Psalm 148, 
Do you notice in verse 1 that the heavens praise the Lord? Do you notice that the angels praise the Lord? All the angelic hosts praise the Lord. Sun, moon, stars, they praise the Lord. The heavens praise the Lord. The waters praise the Lord. Let them praise the name of the Lord. And he commanded that they were created. And he's also established them forever and ever. He's made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord. Here they are from the earth. Sea monsters and all thieves. Fire, hail, snow, clouds, stormy wind, filling in his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all seasons. Beasts, there they are again. Beasts and all cattle, creeping things, winged fowl. And notice this, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. Everything else God created praises him. But he doesn't give them a choice. Just by his creation of them, they praise him. We are the only beings created that he gives us a choice as to whether we'll choose to praise him or not. Everything else is going to praise him because of his design, because of the way he's placed them in our universe. But we, as the people he has created, have a choice whether or not we'll praise him. Everything else in all his creation praises him. Do we? Do you? Do I? Do we praise Him? God chose us to praise Him in, in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is in Christ. And He chose to redeem us through His Son to be His special people to bring Him praise and glory. So the challenge for us is as we look at dinosaurs and everything else God created, we see God's handiwork. We see His glory displayed. The question is, will I live in such a way to give Him glory and honor? You're not yet in Christ. Now would be a great time to come in obedience to Him.